took a Scottish guitarist James Akers to actually pay attention to this part of the legacy of the Russian guitar, uh, or rather guitar in Russia. A few years ago, I was very lucky to come into the possession of a very beautiful replica eight string Stauffer style romantic guitar. And although you can just play normal romantic guitar music on it for a six string instrument, I wanted to explore a repertoire that was specific to this instrument with the two extra bass strings and the extended upper register as well. And while I was looking through the music, one figure kept recurring and that was Ivan Klinger. I found his music just spoke to me as with its beauty, its originality, its the range and breadth of his compositional undertaking. And so I was shocked when to discover that nobody else had ever recorded or explored his music before. And that's how this project came about. The difficulty being for me as a non-Russian speaker, a non-Cyrillic reader, that Klinger being from the Russian Empire of the 19th century, all the sources for, of information were in a language I couldn't understand and even an alphabet I couldn't make any sense of. So a further bit of serendipity was that I was made able to make contact with Oleg Timofeev, who is the world's leading authority on all things relating to the Russian historical guitar. And he was able to fill in a lot of information and give some background on the life and work of Ivan Klinger. Ivan Klinger uh, was a military officer of rather high rank uh, who also was an amateur guitar player but amateur in the best sense of the word because he was a really advanced in what he did and he published quite a bit of music. What is unusual about him and that's why he generally falls out of the scope of my study is that he didn't play the Russian variety of the instrument with seven strings but instead he played the European six-string guitar with extended bass range. Of, uh, so th that's important to realize that in the 19th century, Russia was a part of Europe and, uh, you know, people spoke foreign languages, you know, the Russian court spoke French, I mean, we, we know all of that. And uh, some people played this cosmopolitan six-string guitar and some people played seven-string guitar. It's completely uh, seven-string guitar that was uh, a totally Russian invention of a different tuning that, that only in Russia was it played. And uh, the number of seven-string guitarists was enormous. The number of those who played the six-string guitar was very, very small. <laughs> Kherson region to the family of uh, uh, colonists, you know, basically Germans. Um, and uh, that may have something to do with the fact that he didn't play the seventh string guitar. You know, sometimes people play, pick up an instrument because of a family connection. Perhaps his parents or somebody had a guitar lying around. So that may be connected to the fact that he didn't play the guitar that was spread all over the uh, Russian Empire. Uh, we don't know much more about uh, him being a German. I, we don't know if he was, and I don't personally know if he was an Orthodox Christian, uh, if he spoke German even, but I think he, he must have. For me personally, the frustrating thing about Klinger is, as a composer is the fact that uh, he's really good like when he, when you find his own material, his own notes that he wrote rather than some He's really elegant and really, uh, you know, really inventive, but he doesn't do it n enough. You know, he, he, we don't find enough of his own compositions. We find his arrangements of other tunes, which are masterful, very good. Uh, the thing that is very interesting about his biography, you know, usually military biographies and many guitarists in Russia and not only in Russia were military officers. Usually military biographies are much better documented. But unfortunately, in those, uh, you know, in those resumes you get from military archives, 
they will tell you how a person progressed in the military hierarchy, but they won't mention. And then, by the way, he really well, he played guitar very well, or he entertained all the soldiers and officers with his expert. No, he, their personality is not mentioned. It's only about pensions. It's about how much they get paid, you know, how, when they progress from one regiment to another and so on. So it's very hard to find anything interesting out of the military history of a guitarist. Except for Klinger, because there was an exciting event in 1847. He was captured, uh, he was ambushed, and he be became a prisoner of war, so to speak, of the Chechens. Now, Russia, Russian Tsar, I think it was Alexander I, got very impressed with the British colonies, you know, with British colonialism, and decided to have something of our own. And so we started colonizing the Caucasus. Turned out, it turned out to be extremely violent, a bloody and unsuccessful affair with lots of wars. You know, the people there didn't want to be colonized. Many of those mount mountain dwelling people were Muslims and they like Chechens and they didn't want Orthodox Christianity to rule over them. They didn't want Russians altogether. So uh, what we learn about Klinger, the person, comes at large from his, uh, from his memoirs, how he spent a year and a half in, in, uh, you know, in prison, in, in, uh, you know, imprisoned by the Chechens. And what's completely astonishing about it, that even though he was treated rather poorly, and the conditions were poor for anybody, including the Chechens themselves, he actually treated them like real people, and he never, never tried to represent them as some kind of subhumans. He was drawn to some kindness that some people showed to him. He, he was the first ethnographic source on Chechens in the Russian language. So that's the interesting part about him. I wish there was a chapter when he would have said, and then I played guitar for them and they really liked it. <laughs> or I wished in his publications later he would have, he would write something like a Chechen song with variations. None of that came about. Instead, the, his, his repertoire is a typical salon repertoire of the epoch, you know, second half of the 19th century. Still, interesting story, The Prisoner of Caucasus. <laughs>
note about uh, information about Klinger. He would have been much worse documented today had he not been in a Chechen captivity. The result of that uh, brought attention of the Chechen scholars, and so there is a, a friend, or rather a Facebook friend of mine, Muslim Murdalov, who published a book on Klinger where he, I mean, the, he was drawn to him because Klinger in turn uh, documented uh, Chechen life in the middle of 19th century. So he was the first ethnographer of the, of the Chechens. And so because of this achievement, Mr. Murdalov just collected everything, every bit of evidence and all the military records. So it's actually a pretty remarkable book. Ivan Klinger that he published, and we only know what he published, I don't think there are any manuscripts, uh, is a very typical kind of collection of, uh, of tunes, uh, typical in the sense that those were the tunes really popular at the time. Um, a lot of them are Russian folk songs, but uh, you know, Russian folk songs in the most uh, generic kind of terms. So a lot of them were composed by uh, professional composers trying to make them in the Russian style and then Klinger wrote uh, professional variations on them. Some of them are actually genuine peasant songs and the peasant instrument was balalaika and uh, Klinger is probably the first uh, guitarist who tried to imitate the balalaika and he, so in several pieces he has, he has a footnote how to imitate the balalaika, how to strum it with your index finger that it sounds like a balalaika. Interestingly, for that, the, for what we know of balalaika sound today, the six-string guitar is somewhat better than the traditional chordal tuned seven-string because you have tunings in fourth and so you get this sound not that different from balalaika at, at times. very popular tunes connected by unfortunately very short interludes you know you, every time I want them to be longer I mean I, I can see that he probably didn't receive a proper musical education but you should remember that none of the Russian composers of his generation did 
include, I mean, when you talk about Glinka and the composers of the mighty handful, none of them were professional musicians by Western standards. They didn't, you know, study in conservatories. So they all had the kind of were home educated by, by kind of governors, governors, you know, and so on. So in this sense, um, his, uh, his compositions, his publications show kind of a, an intuitive uh, musical taste that kind of is enviable, so good at it. There is absolutely enough evidence to see that uh, that uh, the repertoire that Klinger published is strongly connected with the repertoire for the much more popular at the time seven string guitar. For example, a lot of the same tunes you find, a lot of the same songs. But the best example is the song, uh, an aria from. Um, from uh, the opera that we know as The Life of the Tsar by Glinka. the arrangement of the tune, I mean, it doesn't have any variations, it doesn't have any, um, you know, any clingers kind of additions to the music. But uh, everything there suggests that he didn't work from the score, but uh, from the opera score, sorry. But the, the only source of his publication is the uh, composition by Andrei Sikhra, the founder of the seventh string tradition in Russia. Uh, Starting from the fact that uh, Sikhar is the only person who, before Klinger who called this aria the orphan song because it's not called orphan song anywhere else and it's important because this character in the opera who happens to be an orphan has another aria much better known and that one is referred to as the orphan song. So this discrepancy was inherited uh, by Klinger from the Russian Seventh-Ring tradition together with this arrangement which just is almost identical to the seventh string arrangement and quite different from the operatic scoring.
Klinger retired from the army in 1864 in poor health. Following the trauma of his internment in Chechnya and he was also suffering from a heart condition which plagued him throughout his life. We see that his published guitar works date from already the mid 1860s so he also had a very productive early stage of retirement where he's he published his works he was composing arranging for the guitar and was very active with other guitarists part of a circle of, of musicians about 15 years before he passed away he suffered a stroke and was largely paralyzed and unable to play and actually sold off all his guitars um, as he could no longer make use of them so all we have left now of Klinger is the music that he composed, which for me is amongst the finest of its era, written for the guitar. In Russia, it's much more difficult to play seven-string music, you know, to show your research on seven-string music, than it is anywhere else in the world. Because the collective mind of the Russian post-Soviet guitarist has been said that this is a second music of secondary importance, that it's not something you won't find great masterpieces, there's nothing really good there. Paradoxically, the same people, if you bring those, you know, Pavlishev, Makarov and, uh, and Klinger, those six-string virtuosos from the, uh, from the 19th century, Russia, you know, Russian variations, that they won't be excited either, you know, they're, they're not into exploration. Today's six-string guitarists would be uh, in Russia, would be perfectly happy with the standard repertoire and they wouldn't be digging in the 19th century Russian archives. So for that we need a foreigner like James Akers, who fearlessly digs out this composer, finds enough for a repertoire and puts out an album of that.